Hi everybody, welcome to my series of videos on mechanics of materials. In these videos I'll be presenting them with topics that are usually covered in a second year engineering course called something like Intro to Mechanics of Materials or something like Solid Mechanics or something else along those lines. Alright, so I won't beat around the bush, this is a tough course. Alright, no matter who you are, at some point you're just not going to understand how to do something or you're not going to have the time to do something and you're going to need some help. So this is why I made these videos. Um, when I was learning this course, I always appreciated it when there was lots of colloquial explanations and lots of examples. Because right? there's nothing worse than being stuck in a rut and then going to a textbook or somewhere else online and then having somebody explain it with this big convoluted technical definition. You just want a straightforward explanation of what's going on. Also I found that lots of examples always helped me so I could see how to do it. All right, monkey see, monkey do. And then after I had some basic principles figured out, that allowed me to tackle the bigger problems. In these videos, I'm also going to emphasize a particular method of solving problems. It's basically nothing really to do with the problem itself, but more just a general method of laying out the problem and like a neatness standard that I try to do in my work. And it's probably good if you adopt some sort of standard for yourself because it'll allow you to get the right answer more often just by doing things cleaner. So, through studying this and after studying this and making these videos, I really developed a passion for this material. Many reasons, really, but the main one is, you know, as an engineer, I like to use math and, you know, scientific principles to describe and design and explain the world around me. Alright, so, because I like to use these principles to just talk about the real world, you'll see lots of examples in my videos. Lots of real world examples. Alright, so especially my introduction videos, so introduction to thermal effects, introduction to axial bars, you'll see some, you know, real world examples where I look at like towers and bridges and, you know, different things like that and just kind of just talk about what's going on there and how that relates to the course material. You also see some bonus videos. Those are basically a more complex question that requires several of the several co concepts that we cover in this course. And yeah, they're usually just a bit tougher, but, you know, I think that they're worthwhile to take a look at and check out because these are the types of problems in the real world, and hey, they're actually kind of fun when you know how to do them. So, let's get right into the material now. So, in mechanics of materials, you're going to find yourself doing lots of statics. So, you probably took a previous course in statics where you find, you know, reactions and things like that at the supports and lots of moments, lots of sum of forces. Alright, so that's going to be very important in this course as well. But in this course, we're going to be very concerned with what's going on inside materials, alright? Inside a beam, inside an axial bar, inside a torsional bar. Because when we talk about things that happen to materials, it's not directly because of the forces that are applied to them. It's because of how they react to the forces that are applied to them. So in this case here, where we have this simple triangular structure being pulled down here at P, there's going to be some sort of internal force developed in this member here and in this member here. All right. So let's just name them. We'll call this upper one, one, this lower one, two. Okay. Now to find out what's going on inside, we need to take a look at what's inside. So the way we do that is by making a cut. All right. And I'll try to draw these with a green pen throughout my videos. Cut here cut here and that'll expose the forces inside. Now I like to draw a little arrow on each side of my cut here indicating which way I'm going to be quote looking and then we take this piece that we cut out and draw a free body diagram of that. Alright so let me sketch this in. Free body diagram. And I like to draw my free body diagrams with more like a stick and ball rather than drawing in the full width of it and I draw my cuts as those little funny looking cut pieces and then you just go about putting back your forces in here P and since we cut here there's gonna be some force just to remain to hold this little piece in equilibrium alright so in order for the whole structure to be in equilibrium any part of that structure should be in equilibrium alright so if we take a look at this piece a look at this piece a look at this piece Anywhere along the, those pieces, the structure should be in equilibrium. 
All right, if it wasn't, this piece would just fall off if that piece wasn't in equilibrium. So there's going to be some sort of reaction developed to this force here. All right, now we always draw those reactions pointing away from the bar, all right? Because unless you explicitly know whether this force is going to be in tension or in compression, you can't figure out if they are or not. So like this structure here, you can say, okay, that's compression, that's tension, right? That's pretty straightforward. But you can get some pretty complicated structures where you don't know. So I won't recommend putting these arrows in by thinking about it, unless it's like so straightforward that you can just like, oh, it's going to be that way, so I'll put it in that way. Or it's going to be that way, I'll put it in that way. You want to just put them in as the things were in tension. That's what pointing away means. And then if it is in compression, your answer will just turn out to be negative. So you won't actually get anything wrong. And this again here is still theta. All right, so we now, to find these two forces, let's just give them a name. We denote an internal force with N. All right, you might have a different notation in your course, but this is what I learned, so that's what I'm going to use. And one, because it's in member one, and two, because it's in member two. All right, now, we need to, of course, find N1 and N2 by doing some of the forces in each direction. Now, as part of my method, I like to really emphasize drawing the directions of the force. This just makes it easy for somebody who's checking your work to say, okay, he's summing up the forces, but what direction? If you don't label your direction, right, you haven't really defined anything. So it's always good to draw the directions and which direction is positive. All right, same with moments. So just as a side note, I like to say counterclockwise moment, like draw it in and then say that's positive. All right, but don't worry about that for this video because it doesn't matter. All right, anyway, some of the forces in the X must equal zero for equilibrium. So negative N1 minus N2 cos theta equals zero. All right, so we'll call this equation one, box it off, all right? Then we go to some of the forces in the y to be zero. All right, p is going down, so it's negative. And two is going down, negative times the sine theta to get this component here. And that equals zero. Okay. Call this two, box it off. All right, so this is like the forces part. All right, so we do our equilibrium equations. We could do a moment equation, but that's not going to tell us anything in this situation. And then we take a look at how many unknowns we have and see if we can solve just with those equations of equilibrium. And it turns out here we can't. N1, N2, theta, we don't know theta. All right, so in this case, you can probably figure it out pretty quickly, but some cases, what I like to call an auxiliary condition is a lot harder to figure out. So I make a separate heading. This is all part of the process that I've came to develop for myself. All right, and we can just see here, this is a six, eight, 10 triangle. All right, kind of just like the sister of the three, four, five triangle, right? So we can say sine theta is of course this over 10. All right, so six over 10, that's three fifths. And then by the same logic, the cosine of that theta is four-fifths. All right, there we go. And after I've got all my equilibrium equations, my con auxiliary equation or conditions, it's just a matter of using algebra to go back and solve for all of the unknowns. So in this case, I like to say, or when I'm like indicating what I'm doing, I like to draw a little like circle and say, okay, I'm going to manipulate equation 2 or 1 in this case. And I'm going to say N2 is equal to negative N1 times 5 over 4. All right, so basically I've just taken this equation, plugged in the cosine of theta, rearranged. All right, and now I'm going to call this 3. Okay, so 1 went into 3. Now I'm going to take 3 and plug it into... 2. All right, that's my notation for that. And then you get negative p minus this bit times 3 fifths, that's the sine of theta, equals 0. And you can solve, and all this cancels. All right, you move n to the other side, times it over, 
n1 equals 4p by 3. Okay, so box it off. And we don't know what p is. You'll find that a lot in mechanics and materials because it'll be asking you, you know, what's the maximum p if the maximum, let's say, normal force was something. Okay, so you've got to get used to solving, you know, equilibrium equations in terms of an unknown. Okay, and now we take n1. All right, so let me just go up over here. N1. Plug that guy back into number one here. And then we can just solve for N2. All right, so we get negative 4P by 3, which was N1, minus N2, sine theta, that's 3 fifths right there, equals 0. In algebra, we get N2 equals negative 5P by 3. So there we have it, our two internal reactions, N1, N2. Now, just like promised, N2 is negative. We already suspected that because this one's going to be in compression. Now, this negative sign just tells us that initially we should have had this arrow drawn the other way. I won't recommend going back, flipping the arrow, just say, okay, it's negative. Therefore, we just write a little compression beside it. And here, we can just write tension. Lots of times, I like to just find the magnitude of something then just look at the problem to see whether or not it's in tension or compression, but like I said, sometimes you can't do that, so it's best just to rely on the math. Alright, there's a bit of a statics refresher for you guys. Um, so a quick review what we did. Drew our picture. In order to find the internal forces, we exposed them by making cuts. We drew a free wider diagram, labeled the directions clearly, summed up our forces, uh, solved for some auxiliary conditions, and did some algebra to find the answer. Alright you guys, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the rest of my videos on Mechanics of Materials.